So in today's lecture, um, we are not going to focus on a specific period. Rather, we are going to look at the um, <clears throat> the feature of traditional Chinese architecture in general. And, uh, but we, you know, we introduced this topic um, <clears throat> at this stage of the class um, because of a important um, book that is published during this period uh, in the uh, Song Dynasty a very important book in, um, for Chinese architecture um, was published and that's called Ying Zao Fa Shi. Uh, this book, Ying Zao Fa Shi. And um, it is like a summary of traditional Chinese architecture, although the historical background for this book is complicated and uh, it has its own purpose, but um, virtually and in, in reality, the book somehow uh, sums up um, the major technical issue of traditional Chinese architecture. And it was also published at a time when the previous development of Chinese architecture reached such a point um, of a um, stage of standardization, right? So it was, it was uh, matured. And um, <clears throat> the scale of construction the complexity of um, architectural projects make standardization a, nece a necessary <clears throat> um, topic uh, for the architectural officials, professionals, and craftsmen. And the book um, also influenced um, the development of Chinese architecture after the Song Dynasty. So we are going to look into, into this, um, this book um, and uh, using it as also as a, an opportunity to, to look at um, the general features and characteristics of traditional Chinese architecture. Some of these um, have been introduced in um, the very first lecture of this class. From the very beginning, um, I have been emphasizing that when we uh, think about traditional Chinese architecture, we must have um, a consciousness that it always referred to a complex. Um, you know, a individual building um, does not complete a full architectural task in the Chinese context. Right, so it's always a complex. And, um, and that complex is made up of many uh, individual structures and those individual structures were uh, connected and unified um, by uh, corridors, you know, verandas, and uh, uh, surrounding a courtyard, and thus create a series of spaces combined. 
So um, in another word, the interior and the exterior should cannot be um, totally separated. Uh, the, the void of the courtyard enclosed by individual buildings is just as significant as the um, roofed spaces, uh, you know, the architectural space under a roof within those individual structures. And um, <coughs> so this is one um, difference. And um, another feature is, you know, traditional Chinese architecture is basically a one story um, tradition. So um, the experience of space horizontally, you know, going through the courtyards, experiencing um, both the interior under a structure and the exterior that was enclo enclosed by these structures um, is an equivalent to our experience of like, entering a building and uh, going through uh, those vertical floors. Uh, <clears throat> so traditional Chinese architecture is, is not like a large scale sculpture with void inside. Um, it is basically spreading on a horizontal plane and one go through it to experience its spatial um, arrangement and that experience, um, you know, is both kind of interior and exterior. Uh, so that enclosed courtyard space is just as significant as the individual building. So that's something we have, we have talked about before. Uh, so, Courtyard in this case is, you know, it is just um, as significant as the individual building. And each individual building, uh, if we compare an architectural work to uh, poetry, then each of the individual building is not a poem. Um, each individual building it's just a verse and uh, it is the connection and the link of those verses um, that create poetry. So we have um, looked at this before and um, the way those courtyards are combined um, was through um, very often through axis. So there's often a dominating axis and that axis is very often oriented north-south. And then, um, you know, north-south axis and then additional axis creating the symmetry and axiality. So, you know, if you look at each individual building, they might look very similar. And um, you don't get a sense of the scale and um, um, sophistic uh, design, sophistic sophistication. It's not reflected in the individual building, rather it is in the, in the complex. Uh, it is in the complex that you realize some build, some architecture is much more sophisticated than than others, right? And uh, like this one, it's uh, the most sophisticated uh, among the complexes in this image. And uh, <coughs> um, you might also start to understand that why the gate um, became such a significant public face, right? So 
in traditional Chinese architecture, the concept of a facade is, is rather foreign uh, because you know, the, um, a building does not have a kind of a public face uh, in, the, in the sense that we, we feel like when we are looking, for example, a Greek temple, you know, there's a face or a Roman um, building. So in this case, the exterior um, elevations are rather um, blank. It's just walls. The majority of them are just a wall without featureless, you know, featureless walls. And then the gate is the only public face uh, to the outside world. So it's very a um, kind of inward looking tradition um, to get a sense of the beauty and the sophistication of a traditional Chinese architectural work, you have to, you know, walk through. Otherwise, you know, from outside, the only thing you see is the, um, the wall and the roof. Um, and then the gate become really symbolic because that is the public face. And usually the gate, um, the roof style um, and the, um, the number of base and decoration, etc., indicate um, the, you know, the rank and the hierarchy um, of the masters um, if the complex is a residential architecture, right? So that is something um, rather telling, you know, about why traditional Chinese architecture makes such a huge emphasis on the roof. Because indeed, from outside, you won't be able to see the, the wall, the most beautiful wall of a building that is only accessible from inside the house, right? But from the street, from the public sphere, you would be able to see the roof. So roof is also somehow the public image of a uh, of an architectural uh, work. So roof and gate, those are the two very important aspects in traditional Chinese architecture because of the way traditional Chinese architecture is related to the public space um, or the urban space in general. So, um, <clears throat> And indeed, the way those courtyards are created is very, very colorful. Uh, it could be arranged into um, circular <coughs> layout, you know, um, different ways of creating those courtyards. Some of them were deep, some of them are wide. And, um, you know, you can always, of course, put additional um, courtyards and uh, expand uh, the, the complex. Um, <clears throat> the standardization is mainly on the individual building. So we have been emphasizing that, you know, Chinese architecture as a complex. But in this lecture, we are going to, you know, look into those individual building and uh, looking into those uh, verses, the vocabulary of traditional Chinese architecture. So, <clears throat> 
And uh, the individual building looks rather um, similar. That's the comments we, uh, we constantly get uh, that you know all traditional Chinese architecture looks alike. They are all the same. And indeed, um, they are very similar compared to the vast difference in Western architecture regarding individual buildings. But you know, now we understand why they all look the same because they are not, each individual building is not the point or it's not all the point uh, at least. But let's look into those individual building, very standardized um, and uh, let's try to understand deeper uh, this unit this architectural vocabulary, how it was composed, and what is the technical um, detail about it. So first, you know, there is a very kind of standardized um, division or standardized composition for uh, individual buildings for the you know Chinese building. Vertically, um, it can be divided into a upper roof and the roof is prominent. And now we understand why the roof is so important. Um, and then in the, in the middle part, um, it's uh, usually a, a timber framework filled with, um, with walls. And um, the timber framework is load bearing. It's directly connected with the roof structure and the enclosing walls are um, not load bearing. And then at the lower part, there's often a platform, some kind of elevated uh, surface and um, um, and that is uh, usually uh, masonry uh, break rammed earth um, in the early period and a later um, of masonry um, work of brick or stone right so this kind of tripartite division into a roof a walled structure and a platform. And the roof is very prominent. Usually um, it is, you know, half the height of the, of the whole building at least. <coughs> um, <coughs> the roof structure is connected with the um, the, 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 the column uh, grid through Dogong, the bracket, right? So we, we looked at Dogong, we looked at um, the, the bracket system um, before in quite some detail, but today we are going to look even more detailed, take a more detailed look at the, um, the bracket. So <clears throat> the basic structure of um, the wooden frame in traditional Chinese architecture um, is <clears throat> kind of a um, post and lintel system, but this post and lintel system um, eventually evolved into a a complicated system. Um, <clears throat> the most simplistic building has um, two columns or two pillars and um, one beam. So here we have the column and we have this beam and uh, the, the column support a beam. And um, in more complicated building, 
um, the joint was made by the bracket, the oval, right? But probably not for just a two-pillared building. As a simplistic building usually does not have bracket, right? Column support beam and a beam support a purlin, right? So these little circle, these are the called a purlin. <coughs> and um, and the purling, you know, support support rafters, right? So those are the rafters. Um, <clears throat> so that's the most simplistic one. And this one represent a more complicated. So it has two or three pillars. So if the scale um, was not too big. And if the, you know, the major beam is strong enough, you might just need two pillars. But if you cannot find that a big um, log, you might need um, a central, a third pillar. So it has, um, Two or three pillars, five, five purlins, right? Five purlins, and uh, two beams. So here, the use of purlin um, made the Chinese timber structure uh, very different from the say medieval um, European timber construction. The European timber construction often use trusses, right? So they use truss. It's a triangular wooden um, member. So it is like combining the beam and uh, And the purlins, um, you know, those combine them together into those triangular structure. But here, <clears throat> um, the Chinese construction are always separate. Um, the pile up materials, instead of combining them into um, a truss, um, you know, for the roof. Right. So here in this more sophisticated one, we have two, per, two pillars, five purlins, and two beams. So these, this upper beam supported by shorter columns, and these are called king post. There's another one in the middle, king post. <coughs> um, <coughs> So it's slightly more complicated. And um, in traditional Chinese books on architecture, they usually re refer the depth of a building by the number of purlins. Um, so this would be, you know, a three purlin, or it's just a you know, just one bay deep uh, in terms of the, the um, you know, it, imagine a Chinese building is always like a rectangular shape like that regarding that dimension, referring to that dimension, the depth, right? So that's a one bay and this is two bays, right? So the, um, of course, the gable side is, is here. So um, you can attach corridors or expand interior space by you know, adding additional, um, additional pillars um, and a purlin to expand um, like this. It's like you, know, you have this previous building, but you, um, 
you insert a shorter beam into this pillar and that beam is supported <clears throat> you know by another beam and uh, expand <clears throat> the building in one direction and in that case you get a asymmetrical roof um, if you just you know attach a, a, a you know a veranda on one side but the standard fashion of expansion is like this <coughs> to um to raise the roof by adding additional beams and additional purlins and if you have large enough wood and strong enough this master beam um, you might get a you know very spacious interior but otherwise you might need to add columns uh, but in both these two building can both be referred to as a building with a depth of seven purlins, right? This is, this one is five purlins. And um, <clears throat> this one had seven, um, had six purlin, but it would be more appropriately referred to as a five purlin building with an attached kind of corridor on one side. Right, so that depth is is usually you know uh, referred to by the number of purlins used. So you know the number of purlins. You 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 basically know um, how many levels um, for the roof um, to raise um, the roof. <coughs> in terms of the number of, of beams to be used. And this would be, you know, the uh, nine purling deep um, interior. And um, so you need, um, you need four beams uh, to raise a roof like that. So this is a kind of simplified um, diagram showing the structure of a wooden frame in traditional Chinese architecture. <coughs> so all those pawns were, were made in this book um, called Yin Zao Fa Shi. The book <coughs> literally means um, construction models, right? So it's meant to be a standardization because the book is meant to provide the models for construction. Fa shi, it's a model. Um, often translated as treatise on architectural methods or state building standard. It was from the Northern Song Dynasty and it was also um, a result of the um, Wang An Shi reform. So Wang An Shi was a like the prime minister of the Song, Northern Song court. He was a high official, very um, influential in the politics of 11th century China. So um, the, <clears throat> the governance and, and the financial situation uh, by the time Wang Anshi came to power uh, was, not, um, was not good. You know, the Song court was facing a formidable enemy from the north, that is the Liao Empire. And, um, um, and it has all kinds of internal issues um, of corruption and, um, um, 
a kind of a rising population and uh, a very large army. And um, um, so all those kind of complicated issues require a reform to make the governance more efficient. And Wang Anshi came up with an idea to, um, you know, among others, you know, he had many, many reforms, but one of the, um, the major um, reform is um, to simplify governance um, or to simplify public works by the use of money. So basically, before one should reform um, regarding <clears throat> um, the public building projects, state building projects, it's usually through um, taxation, right? Um, the people, the farmers uh, submit partial of their products as the, um, as the text. And um, they also, you know, participate, contribute their time, contribute their labor um, for public works as well. So that was, was, was the, how previous state buildings um, financed. It's basically through those, those um, labors um, substituting the, um, the tax. But Wang Anshu came up with an idea, instead of taking, taking the real actual goods and labor from the people, he, um, he used use money as a medium for everything. So the farmers would also uh, submit money and then the government, the, the public services service would use that money to buy, to buy, um, you know, grain and other food product. Um, and um, so all the taxation were paid to the government um, using money. So it looks, you know, very commonplace today, but it was not uh, in the 11th century. So, and um, so the tax revenue was used to hire uh, craftsmen and labor for the state building projects. Basically, um, that was one, a, a major step he, you know, he made um, in the, um, you know, regarding kind of architecture uh, in the Wang Anshi reform. So that change made the um, construction of public buildings um, a profitable project for, for those officials uh, supervising it, right? It, it's certainly sim simplified. Now the government or the um, uh, different levels um, of the government can simply, you know, hire uh, people to do their building project and they, they can control it better. Now you have, you, you can just uh, uh, go to those, those organized um, construction um, organizations to to find a you know a, a better way instead of having those people coming from different region and and uh, they might not have known each other before uh, until they come together for a building project so that certainly is a benefit but now uh, a new issue um, was created that is you know when the money was, was engaged and corruption happens. So um, there is a need to have some kind of um, 
um, estimate uh, some kind of a projection projecting about how much a building um, project might cost and how long it will take and um, you know to to plan ahead um, in order you know to have a better um, financial situation and this is especially significant uh, for the top level administ administrators like the prime minister like the emperor himself so <clears throat> now they need to to understand um, they cannot use uh, the the um, kind of a free labor anymore. They must consider how how much the the pay um, they need to pay uh, for a public project, and that is part of the reason for um, the compilation of Ying Zao Fa Shi. It provide a book for the emperor. <clears throat> And the book was dedicated to the emperor. It was addressed to the emperor um, by um, an official whose name is Li Jie, or some other scholars um, would interpret his name as Li Cheng because you know there are different versions. You know, the uh, old Chinese books were wood wood carving um, boards, you know, printed basically. Um, Woodblock prints, and uh, it's very easy to make mistake. And sometimes the, uh, the character does not um, look the same, and there are different interpretation of his name, <coughs> even. So he was a um, kind of a official managing public work for the court. So he compiled this book and he wrote a introduction and um, and uh, that introduction was addressing to the emperor uh, basically so the book was not created for architectural professionals to, as a to consult it is for the emperor for the um, administrator to consult so that the understand if they are going to build a you know, complex of four courtyards and, um, you know, kind of a middle rank building. Um, the main major building is uh, seven bay uh, by four bays, um, et cetera, and et cetera. The, the understand how much they might need to pay. So that is the purpose of that book. The book was um, the first, the first um, edition, which didn't survive today, um, came in 1091. And then the final edition um, is from 1103. And that is usually um, the date we would give to this book. But today, none of those early two editions survived. We only have later kind of reproduction <coughs> from a um, from the thirteenth century. The earliest edition survived today is the uh, the thirteenth century edition, right? So the book <coughs> was published at a time um, if we compare to Western European architecture. You know, Li Jie, uh, the compiler of the book, was a contemporary of Sujet of Saint Denis. You know, who was the initiator of Gothic cathedral, right? Um, Abbot uh, Sujet. So it's kind of a medieval, but the comprehensiveness and complexity of the book. Uh, is comparable to Vitruvius' 10 books on architecture um, from the first century BCE. So they are uh, like Vitruvius' 10 books. Um, Ying Zao Fa Shi also had, had many, many volumes, um, but in terms of time, 
it is um, contemporary to the medieval, uh, medieval European uh, tradition. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, so here the um, background for its and the purpose for its publication um, to simplify the control of cost and quality for public commissioned works. So the book uh, can be divided into five major sections. Um, the first part uh, explain, basically explain terminology. The first part reads like, like a dictionary almost. Um, so th it offers some basic building data and also explain the terms by defining, you know, um, what a, a specific um, term that are going to be used throughout the book, what does that mean? But it was explained in a way to cite historical, to cite historical um, works to explain it. So, um, so it would explain, for example, the term of a, for a pavilion and by looking at what is the definition of a pavilion in the Zhou dynasty, um, you know, more than a thousand year uh, before the 11th century. Um, so it, to some extent, also make the current architectural tradition um, connected with history and uh, talking as if that the classical period of the Zhou dynasty is still pretty much the same um, as the Song dynasty. So that is the sense you always get when you are reading old Chinese books. It, you don't get a feeling of change. Um, it feels almost like the Zhou dynasty, um, you know, the current age is, is just, a, um, well, usually not the same. Usually it's feel, you feel it's worse than the Zhou dynasty. So the Zhou dynasty in traditional Chinese culture is sometimes, you know, discussed as a ideal period, um, a golden age, um, a lost paradise, almost you have that kind of feeling. So you really don't get have a sense about, you know, the past is, is primitive and now we are getting better and the closer to our own period, it, the, that kind of progressive sense of history uh, is not there. So in the Ying Dao Fa Shi, it's the same thing. So. Zhou Dynasty was mentioned and cited because it is it offers standard. It is like you know everything from Zhou Dynasty is good. So um, we define our architectural terminology. You know the authority of our definition also came from the from those old definition. So you get a very strong sense of a um, the past is is good and ideal and actually history get worse and worse. Um, you have that kind of declining feeling when reading those classical Chinese text. So that, um, that kind of explain, you know, why when they define architectural term, they would cite the authority of Zhou dynasty to make their definition. So it's like, reads like a, you know, um, dictionary, but, Again, it has that um, sense of traditional Chinese culture. And um, the second part um, provide a reason like a, like a legal document. It talk about a lot of regulations um, regarding public work, regarding architecture. <laughs> and then the third part um, look reads like an accounting book 
regarding architecture. They talk about the cost, talk about the labor, um, you know, the, the amount of labor. And then the fourth part talk about material. And then the fifth part, which is also the most interesting part is just the drawings. So it provided many really beautiful, um, beautiful drawings. So um, some images from later publication, republication of the, of the book. And uh, <clears throat> a famous um, reprint of the book from the, um, about a hundred years ago from the early 20th century. It's like this, so I'm showing you just uh, two volumes from that book. And the book um, originally was divided um, into 34 volumes. And um, so those 34 volumes were divided into kind of five sections and each section focus on, you know, what I just talked about before. First part, glossary of technical terms. And the second part, talk about rules and regulations for the various crafts in building. And the third section, so volume 16 to 25, talk about financing issue, the cost and the labor. And the uh, fourth part, um, talk about the accounting information and standards for material used in the construction. And then finally, the fifth part, which include volume 29 to 34 are just illustrations. Okay. So the early 20th century reprint of the book <clears throat> add color, uh, but originally it does not have this color and these color in the earlier editions were indicated uh, by words. So they just uh, put a, you know, green here and, uh, you know, red for that part. So not filling with actual color. Um, so those are all indicated in words in those earlier um, editions. But for the 20, 20th century edition, actual color, um, were added to the printing process. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, the book, um, there are many, many concepts um, from this book that eventually became standard vocabulary, standard term for traditional Chinese architecture. Among them are and So these were from the terms from Ying um, Zhao but now became a standard vocabulary in traditional uh, Chinese architectural carpentry. Da Mu Zuo refer to the timber structures, right? So these are Da Mu Zuo. They are structural. Uh, without these, a, a proper construction of da mu zuo, which can be translated as um, the great carpentry or the big carpentry, um, a building would not stand, you know, without the proper uh, construction of da mu zuo. Right? So it include the column, beam, purling, rafter, those major skeleton. It also include uh, dogong, brackets. Brackets is part of the da mu zuo. What is xiao mu zuo? Xiao mu zuo is, means, you know, the lesser carpentry or the smaller carpentry, right? So it refer to the non-structural wooden element, uh, those being used in interior and those sem semi-permanent furnitures. So for example, uh, included in Xiao Mu Zuo would be door, window, um, a balustrade, 
So those would be referred to as, as you know, or a shelf. Um, so those are non-structural wooden element called xiao mu zuo. So this is still the standard term used in architectural carpentry. <coughs> and the book had many illustrations on the bracket sets. Right? Those bracket sets, um, bracket sets were uh, illustrated um, with, you know, in kind of different color and those color were spe specified um, in the book. And um, the patterns and the color um, are also uh, specifically named. So each of those style were also standardized. So not only in terms of structure, but also in terms of um, decoration. So they, all, they were all given a specific name, a specific, specific term for the brackets as well, <clears throat> those decorations. So for these two, for example, structurally speaking, they are all the, they are the same. However, they were given different name and the different name is because of the decoration, the painting, basically. So um, <clears throat> the Chinese had been painting their architecture for a long time. And in the Song Dynasty, these painting were standardized, right? So you, you use painting to decorate wooden structure and also to protect it because wooden structure, um, if it is exposed, um, it deteriorate faster. Um, the paint somehow add a layer of insulation from moisture, from you know, uh, bad worms. Um, and in the Song Dynasty, those decorations were also standardized. <clears throat> Um, the book also offered um, you know, um, a few different types of drawings that is comparable to our modern way of classifying architectural drawings. So in Ying Zhao Fa Shi, a major type of drawing is called a Ce Yang Tu. So uh, and two means picture, right? Or drawing. So yang <coughs> it's comparable to our section drawing. It shows the building looks um, like a, a cross section of a building. So the roof seems being cut away to expose the internal construction. Um, so you see how um, the column support the bracket and how this bracket support a beam and how this beam support the rafter and how this rafter support those, uh, I'm sorry, the purlin, how this beam support the purlin and then how this purlin support rafters um, and how a corridor is added by adding um, another column, beam, you know, beam, purlin, and rafter, right? <clears throat> so it, um, so that's called a ce yang or ce yang tu, comparable to our section drawing. But one difference is if you look at, you know, it shows the lower platform. Uh, in perspective, right? So in the way we draw section, we wouldn't make that line. Uh, that looks as if this is, we are looking down at the uh, platform. <coughs> um, <coughs> a second type of drawing provided in Ying Zhao Fa Shi is called a Di Pan Tu, or the Di Pan. The floor plan. Basically, this is the floor plan. However, the floor plan 
um, or Di Pan Tu from Ying Zhao Fa Shi does not provide much detail about how the interior space was to be divided. It doesn't show the room. It looks rather like we are looking up under a roof and look at the um, how you know the um, the ceiling looks because it shows just the um, how the bay were divided. It show it emphasize the grid made by the columns, right? So these black dots are all columns. And uh, <clears throat> the single line is the location of the major horizontal members of, of beam and purling, right? So these are um, the major direction uh, where, you know, the beam is located and on the other direction, that's the purling uh, line. And th those double line are the location where brackets are to be um, to be installed. So those double line indicate the bracket sets. So it, in another word, just like in the Ceyang Tu, the Di Pan Tu, it's basically showing the same structure, but looks, you know, looks uh, from a different angle. You know, this is looking straight, and uh, the other, the Di Pan Tu is looking down or looking up uh, from that direction. So it basically shows where these columns are located and where those things are located and the double line refer to where these brackets are to be put, right? So in another word, it is, it made no effort, you know, to show the door or, you know, inside you divide a room like that, you put another door there. Um, it, this is not the purpose of of Di Pan Tu. It does not specify the function. In another word, this plan can be constructed for any architecture. It can be used for the construction of a Buddhist hall. It can also be used to for the construction of a imperial palace or a Taoist temple or you know an Islamic mosque anything. So the function and interior division is not the interest of these drawings. These drawings were meant to control the major construction and um, to generalize architecture into different type. And, uh, <clears throat> and indeed, uh, no matter whether you are building a Buddhist temple or an imperial palace, the cost of a hall like that would be similar, right? So it's irre irrelevant. Those issues were irrelevant to the problem this book was aiming to solve. And it also provides another type of um, drawings that shows the detail um, of a beam in this case and the bracket uh, in this, in the one on the right. And those are the words uh, indicating the color, which allows a 20th century reprint to create a colorful illustration for the same uh, detail. <clears throat> So the previous drawings were from the original um, print um, from the, <clears throat> before the modern age. 
And in the modern age, Professor Liang Sicheng, you know, the reading you have been, you just did, um, made what, according to him, a more scientific illustration to the Yingzao Fa Shi. And these drawings were produced in the mid 20th century by Professor Liang, um, the author of one of the major textbooks uh, for this class. Right? And um, you can see his drawing um, the, in terms of proportion, the brackets is significantly smaller compared to the original drawing where the brackets are uh, big, right? And of course, that is because um, Professor Liang's drawing was was drawn to the uh, scale according to modern standard, right? So it's, it's, um, it could be considered as more accurate in terms of proportion, in terms of the relative scale between the bracket and the, um, the beams um, based on the numbers given in the book. So this is drawn um, using the measurement provided in the book and um, everything was regulated by the same scale, right? And also, of course, that little line disappeared in this more, you know, according to Liang, more scientific drawing, because that is kind of uh, conflicting in our modern way of illustration. This is a section drawing. This is a section drawing. Section drawing, you don't see that perspective line on the platform. All that plane reduced to just one straight line. So this is um, kind of a drawing made in the um, mid 20th century for the same book. Um, 